wait for him to respond back so we don't get a boink. I think you just did. Middle. No, that was me. Oh. That was that my was Skype good. impression. Pretty I know, good. right? Yeah, like a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to AT Banter, the podcast where we discuss anything and everything regarding the world of assistive technology with our hosts, Steve Barkley, Rob Minot, and Ryan Fleury. Now, let's banter. Hey, and welcome to another episode of AT Banter. Oh, you stole my thunder. I did. Ha ha. Damn it, I think I'm becoming too predictable. Absolutely, after 44 Whatever. shows. You know? People love it. People, <laughs> people love the repetition. And, uh, you know, that way, you know, I'm sure there's a ton of people when they listen to the podcast and I say, hey, and welcome to... <laughs> and there's this, this chorus of voices being like, That's hey, right. be better. <laughs> we could, we're going to record in Rogers Arena one day live oh, wow. and it'll be a whole audience participation thing. You'll see. That's okay to dream. Hey, guess what? I am Rob Minow. And with me today is Ryan Flurry. That's me. That's right. Uh, yeah. Okay, here we are. And, and no Steve today. No Steve today. He is out on business. Business. So it's just the two of us. Uh, we have a great, great show for everybody today. Just the two of us. Uh, we are going to finally, it's like, it's like come full circle. We're finally going to be talking to somebody from the Rick Hansen Foundation. Now, and it is not Rick Hansen. It is not Rick Hansen. I don't maybe I we apologize should, I don't know, for should that. we should we not bring it up? I don't think we should bring it up no? to Marco. I don't know. No, probably not. No. No. Let's skip that. Yeah. The our audience, our our the super they fans. Know. The super fans know what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, anyways, um <clears throat> we are talking to Marco uh from the Rick Hansen Foundation. Who and Marco is an ambassador uh, to the foundation, and we're going to find out exactly what an ambassador is, w- what the foundation does, and uh, and its background, and and what it's been doing, and all kinds of stuff. Lots of stuff. Um. Well, uh, so uh, you know what? Uh, how was your week? My week's been okay. You know, I'm finding it kind of hard to get out and do stuff. Right. Um, I'm a I'm a homebody, so I like being at home. Me so too. Linda really has to kind of push my ass to get out the door and get some air. Right. But no, things are fine. You know, I started guitar lessons from a neighbor last Tuesday. You mean you're you're giving guitar lessons? No, I'm getting guitar lessons. Oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because I don't know a lot, so it's time to learn more. Cool. I have lots of time on my hands. So. Yep. Yeah, it's good. That, you're right. It's a good time to to take advantage of uh, having a little bit of time and. Yep. Good time to learn how to ride an app. Yeah, we should really learn how to do a podcast, actually. We should probably (laughs) take some courses or something, figure out what we're doing. I'm hoping one of the shows this summer I get some other podcasters on that we can talk to that have been doing it for a while and just kind of banter back and forth. You know, there are podcasts out there that occasionally will do like live shows and uh, you know sell tickets and stuff to go to go watch them do a podcast. We, oh, is we that actually, right? yeah, we might actually <laughs> keep an eye out for something like that. There was actually one that did that just just recently at the New West Library, really um, near me. I think it was last week, but I didn't get around to going. I I, I thought about it, huh. uh, but then I just I kind of forgot. So it could be interesting. Yeah, we should think about doing that. Cause well, the only problem is most of our listeners are in the U.S., aren't they? I know. They're, they're everywhere. Are they? Yeah, they're everywhere. Hmm. No, I wouldn't say most of them. No? Not anymore. Oh, good. No. we have Go Canada. Well, actually, you know, I say that, and I actually, I don't really know. I haven't uh, actually looked at the stats. But, I mean, so what? I mean, it's, it's true. It, it doesn't matter. That's we true. We love everybody. We do, indeed. All right. Uh, well, then... Uh, I think we should we should go ahead and bring Marco on. All right, let's do it. All right, we are really happy to have with us today Marco Pasqua, who is an ambassador for the Rick Hansen Foundation. Um, Mark Marco. Yes. Thanks. Thanks so much for joining us. 
Oh, thank you for having me. I uh, I think what you guys are doing is really cool, especially by shining a light on accessible technology. Um, this is a space that I've been passionate about for many, many years. It's one of the reasons um, I started out in my career in video game design and technology and things like that. And my career and my life has just sort of morphed as the years have gone on. And I'm so proud to represent uh, the Rick Hansen Foundation as an ambassador. Uh, well, yeah, and, and we really appreciate the time. I mean, we've been we've been sort of reaching out to to the Rick Hansen Foundation for a while and wanting to to you know talk to somebody from there um, mm -hmm. because it, it is such an important uh, foundation and and the message and the goals are you know are are really really important. So thanks Huge. thanks again for joining yeah. us. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, you know what? Let's start at the beginning. Well, tell us a little bit about what what is an ambassador. What do you do? Yeah, abs absolutely. So, I mean, Rick Hansen ambassadors are individuals that come from essentially all different walks of life. Um, generally speaking, they're individuals uh, who've been impacted by uh, a disability of some sort. Uh, but more importantly, an ambassador really represents the foundation, everything that it stands for. And, uh, and that's why I got involved, because, you know, I love the fact that uh, the Rick Hansen Foundation represents individuals of a wide range of abilities uh, to share their personal stories about overcoming barriers. Um, however, also tying in that message that Rick started on uh, back in 1985 when he did his Man in Motion tour. And really that message that everyone with disabilities across our country is capable. Um, they just need to be shown, uh, you know, the respect to really engage and, and be out there in their community and doing what they love to do. And that's really what being an ambassador is all about, sharing your personal story while also sharing uh, what it is that Rick has done uh, 30 years ago this year would be the 30th anniversary, actually. Wow. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to believe it's been that long. I mean, I remember it quite well. Yeah. What, did, did Rick ever come through your community and you actually saw him kind of wheeling by? No. Well, not not myself. Uh, I lived in a, a very small mill town that, that wasn't really on any sort of route. I think my wife did. We live in Coquitlam, and I think okay. she remembers him trying to wheel his wheelchair up one of the big hills here in Coquitlam. <laughs> and back then, it would have been a major challenge. You know, I always say that Rick is the reason, Rick and Terry Fox, actually, are the reason why we're so blessed in the greater Vancouver area for having so many curb cuts and so many built environment and infrastructure positive changes is because guys like Rick have been advocating for 30 years. And sometimes it does take that long uh, for sustainable change. Right. Right. That's right. So, so I know for me, uh, so I'm 31, so I wouldn't have been really coherent at the time that, uh, <laughs> that Rick was out there doing his thing. But I have come across many individuals in the talks I've given for the uh, Rick Hansen Foundation who said that seeing him in their own community not only brought tears to their eyes, but it really did actually bring hope uh, to their lives, uh, their lives and their families' lives, seeing this guy uh, starting out on this mission. And we're talking pre-social media, pre-any yeah, right. of this stuff where you could really say, is somebody being a social influencer? I mean, he really set the bar for what it means to say, this is a mission. This is something that I want to take on for myself. And I know Rick has told me many times he never thought it would blow up to be as big as it actually eventually did. Right. Well, maybe tell us, uh, take us through what exactly the foundation does and, and what, are, what some of the mandates are. Absolutely. So uh, the foundation itself was established in 1988. And this was after uh, Rick's uh, Man in Motion tour. And essentially, um, it's been Rick's lifelong goal in creating an inclusive world for all individuals with disabilities to unlock their full potential. So for the past three decades, the foundation has been doing everything they can to raise awareness, change attitudes, and remove barriers for people with disabilities, uh, as well as they've done a lot of work to fund spinal cord injury research and care. So uh, it started off with the foundation, and then uh, Rick was actually able to open up uh, the Bl the Bluson Center uh, in Vancouver as well for the research component of uh, of the spinal cord injury research. So it's pretty interesting. Uh, he has his own Rick Hansen Institute uh, that is the the sort of governing body that over overlooks the Bl uh, the Bluson Center uh, for spinal cord injury research, which is great. And then the foundation side of things is where uh, they work with all levels of government and, and a variety of public and private sector partners. 
uh, and disability organizations. So, I mean, this is a huge conglomerate, um, but I love the fact that the foundation's ultimate goal is to really focus on accessibility programs and to partner with the government, as we know that they can have a great deal of reach by partnering with government organizations and external partners to really expand that initial vision that Rick had. And that's the whole point of the foundation. Um, and and can you can you walk us through some of the maybe the different programs that that are um, that that the foundation deals with? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Uh, so, well, first and foremost, um, all the programs are designed uh, to increase awareness for the poten- uh, for the potential of individuals with disabilities, which is a huge key there. Um, and there's a big, big focus on creating accessibility and creating an inclusive world. So uh, one of the programs is the Rick Hansen School Program. And this actually starts out teaching youth in Canada about the importance of inclusion um, and also encourages them to creatively think about the different ways that they can remove accessibility barriers uh, for people with disabilities. So I think for me personally, being able to be, uh, you know, speak as part of the school programs is great because you're starting out in our communities for these individuals at a young age. You know, I, I still wheel around. I have cerebral palsy. I don't have a spinal cord injury. I have cerebral palsy. Uh, so I've had my disability my whole life. And I've been in malls and different public spaces where you see still to this day see uh, parents shushing their kids when you hear them ask questions uh, right. mommy what's wrong with that man you know and and Actually, that's the kind of thing we want to avoid um, parents feeling like it's taboo to ask questions. Uh, Personally speaking, I think it's fantastic. And I'll open up to that child when I hear uh, the child ask questions. And I'll just be very frank with them and say, well, I was born. uh, And when I was born, unfortunately, an accident happened, which caused me to have to use this wheelchair now. But this wheelchair helps me to get around and and move around just as easily as you do. And you see that, that child's eyes light up as soon as they learn that. And that's the whole goal behind the school program is teaching the youth at an early age so that they don't uh, develop those stigmas when they grow up to be older. Right. Right. Um, So and then, of course, there's the ambassador program, which uh, I'm a representative of. And again, this program is great because it really empowers individuals with disabilities of all kinds, uh, vision, hearing, uh, physical, you name it, to go out there and share their stories at the various schools across Canada. And these presentations give them a real opportunity to encourage the audiences to create an accessible and inclusive Canada, uh, which is really ultimately Rick's uh, number one goal. Uh, most excitingly, though, is that the Rick Hansen Foundation has recently created an accessibility certification program. And this is actually to measure the accessibility uh, of the built environment and determine how each individual building that gets assessed meets these requirements. Right. So this is the only type of program in Canada that is like this. They just established this and it uses a rating system that's similar to, I don't know if you guys have heard of LEED, uh, which is like the environmental efficiency uh, for buildings. Uh, okay. So, you know, buildings can get LEED certified and say, this is at a platinum level. What, what Rick and the team is trying to do is create a program that is very similar to this and say, you go into this library and you can know, uh, right off the top of your head that, hey, this building meets uh, the Rick Hansen Foundation certification platinum level. And that means a certain bit of criteria. It means that, you know, ultimately that it's the most accessible for all individuals with disabilities. So a very, very exciting thing that they've uh, established this program. Um, They've launched the pilot uh, project in BC in the fall of 2016, and they're running it through June of this year. And they actually have a team of 13 trained assessors who are measuring the accessibility of these buildings and the businesses in the Lower Mainland and Victoria. So there's a there's a group here in the Lower Mainland. There's also a, a satellite group in Victoria that's doing the same thing. Now, all these services are free of charge uh, because it's part of the pilot program. And it's really to give building owners and managers a greater understanding of the accessibility of their venues and what they can do to become more accessible. So it's an education piece. Yeah, yeah. I, was, I was fortunate that I had the opportunity to actually go through the certification myself and actually learn firsthand because outside of being an ambassador, I actually used to work directly with the foundation as a community manager for their online platform called Planet, which is like a, uh, almost like Yelp for accessibility. Okay. Uh, but now they've shifted gears and they're really, really putting a lot of time and their energy and efforts into this certification program, which I think is great and it's huge because nobody I know in Canada has the clout like Rick to get a program like this <laughs> off the ground. Right. Well, and you're hitting, you know, you're hitting all the right points. Um, <clears throat> you know, you, you want to go after the youth. I mean, I think of, I think back to when I was in school. I mean, we had nothing like 
you know, this, you know, inclusion, you know, accessibility education programs. Um, And those are the people that you want to go with, go, you know, after, because um, it's really a mindset that has to change. Totally. Um, You know, inclusion and universal design really, I mean, needs to just become a thing Um, instead of, you know, historically, accessibility was always an add-on it was something that you know the builders they would they would put ramps in but they would put them in after the fact rather than designing the buildings from the ground up to be inclusive yeah you know and i think that the interesting thing about what you say there it's kind of funny is the fact that people with disabilities have been around as long as people have been around That's right. and so it's not about being an add-on and i and i really think that um, we're at the perfect time in 2017 where people are breaking down those attitudinal barriers. And that's really the first barrier. Before you talk about physical or built environments, the first barrier is people's attitudes towards it, right. thinking that it's going to cost them more money when ultimately a lot of people don't realize, especially uh, building owners or managers, that if you plan ahead in the blueprints to have a universal design approach to the things that they're creating, that you're actually going to save money because there's less two by four going into the framing of the building to make a door wider. Uh, Oftentimes, these ramps or installations don't have to cost tens of thousands of dollars. It's just about being thoughtful while you're in the planning stages to really, really incorporate individuals with disabilities, but not just disabilities. Ultimately, uh, at the end of the day, we're all going to have some form of disability as we get older or uh, accessibility need. And I think that the coolest thing that the Rick Hansen Foundation is doing is focusing on the aging population population because essentially here in Canada today there's over 3.8 million Canadian adults that have a disability uh, that represents uh, one in seven people now that's based on a statistics statistics Canada uh, report in 2012 but you can imagine that means by like mm, 2036 uh, they, they actually estimate that we're going to be at about 7.7 to 8.7 million Canadians with some form of disability. And that's obviously going to incorporate a lot of the baby boomers and people that are just using assistive devices and want to just be able to access a building or a service the way that it was intended for everyone. That's right. And I mean, I guess, you know, the important part of this is that universal design uh, benefits everybody. It, it doesn't yes. just benefit people with, with disabilities. And I mean, and that's not even counting the amount of people who have to say temporary disabilities, somebody who's who's on crutches yep. uh, trying to get into to some sort of building. You know, they're going to benefit absolutely from a ramp as opposed to trying to take stairs. So, yeah, it's it's just it's an attitudinal change that that I think going after the young the young generation. That's the key. Yeah, you know, the the most hopeful thing I think I notice is that the youth of today, I find, maybe it's just me, but are, are a lot more thoughtful and inquisitive when it comes to these kinds of things. I think it's becoming less of a big deal that somebody maybe has some different abilities. And I think that that's great. I really attest to programs like the Ambassador Program and the Schools Program to really launch a, a change in attitudes. And ultimately, that was Rick's goal. It started with spinal cord injury research. And like I said, now it's expanded into unlocking the potential of all individuals with disabilities. But ultimately, as you said, it could be a temporary disability. Somebody may be using a crutch. And essentially, if you can create that physical change to the environment, you're not only uh, opening up opportunities for the physical environment to be better, you're actually opening opportunities for employment, for example. Because right. if somebody couldn't get into the building, but they have all the skill sets that an employer is looking for, um, <laughs> right. they just literally needed sl- slight adaptions in order to make it work for them now you're not preventing that because sometimes it could be a single step that's preventing somebody with a disability to get in and pay or use a service of a of a business and you know we also want to break down the stigma that all individuals with disabilities must mean that they're on on welfare or disability support and they're not able to sustain themselves or be contributing members of society ultimately this all ties back into creating quality of life for all of our community members right yeah. Now, how long have you been an ambassador for? So I've been an ambassador since 2015. Uh, however, Rick has inspired me uh, my entire life. And I actually had the first opportunity to meet Rick, uh, I would say, probably back in, 
I'd say either 1996 or 1998, and that was through the BC Summer Games for Athletes with Disabilities. I don't know if many people know, but you know, prior to Rick being the great man that he is today, he was also a very accomplished athlete, and yeah. uh, he wasn't competing at that time, but he was actually refereeing one of the ba wheelchair basketball games that I was playing. Oh, and of boy. course, at that time, everybody knew who Rick was, so I took the opportunity to shake his hand, not knowing in the slightest that you know, 10, 20 years later, I would actually end up being working with him directly uh, and really helping him to flesh out and be a part of those programs. So the ambassador program is just a part of me saying thank you so much to Rick and his team for everything that they do. But uh, but ultimately, he's been making that impact in my life personally uh, for you know 10 or 20 years now. So how did you become an ambassador? What was the process like? Yeah, so it was a fairly interesting process. Um, I'll tie it actually back into how I started to work with the foundation. So um, I, uh, several years ago, I uh, became like a co-founder of a company called Reality Controls. And Reality Controls is an organization or, or a company here locally in Vancouver that creates um, like augmented and virtual reality uh, products. Uh, and also, ultimately, because of my input uh, with this organization, we've been able to create products that help to increase uh, individuals' accessibility uh, mm -hmm. by using uh, motion and voice control technology, which is really, really neat because sometimes individuals don't have the dexterity to do that. And so uh, a couple of years ago in 2013, I had the opportunity with my uh, with the founder, uh, my partner, Sean Sibbett, to be a TEDx Stanley Park speaker. And we were speaking about accessible technology. Right. So that went great. We did our TED talk and that was fantastic. And actually, one of the organizers of that TED event uh, she remembered me several years later. And as it happens, she worked for a company that was helping the Rick Hansen Foundation take off some of their technology platforms. At this time, it happened to be Planet. And so she reached out to me saying, I don't know if you remember me, but I met you at the TED Talk and they're looking for somebody to be a community manager. You know, obviously, have you heard of the Rick Hansen Foundation? Well, of course I'd heard of the Rick Hansen Foundation. Uh, so long story short, I ended up uh, coming on, being accepted as the community manager for Planet. At. And that's really what started my journey in saying, uh, reaching out to the ambassador coordinator at that time, Rob Dunfield, and saying, listen, I've already been preaching Rick's message for many, many years. I know you have an ambassador program, you know, do you think that it would be useful for me to join the program? And as as it happens, around that time, they had just expanded their vision as an organization uh, to include all individuals with disabilities to unlock the potential. Uh, and so Rob was like, of course, that sounds like a fantastic idea. Uh, and with my background as a speaker, he was just like, it's a it's a no brainer. So uh, that's basically the long and short of it is I was able to contact the uh, ambassador coordinator. But now if anybody's interested in becoming a Rick Hansen Foundation ambassador, they can just go over to rickhansen.com and look up the ambassador program and just submit a request through that way. I mean, the list of individuals and backgrounds of entrepreneurs, people in the business community, uh, individuals who are newly injured but want to make an impact. I mean, our ambassadors are fantastic individuals, and it's all about that authenticity and sharing their story. So let me ask you this, um, and I know, I mean, you, you haven't really been with the foundation uh, for that long, but you've been in the community. So how have you felt over the past, say, 10 years? Like, have you, yeah. have you felt that things have, have gotten a lot better? Um, I mean, I, I know personally for us, we're really noticing um, the, the idea of inclusion and universal design is really gaining a lot of traction. And I think a lot yep. of it has to do with um, social media. And um, I think more, more and more people are able to have a voice. And so we're able to sort of get some traction. Have you noticed that? Oh, 100 uh, percent. And I don't think I'm, it's because uh, I'm just involved in the space. And now I'm starting to notice it more. I mean, I look around our community and think to myself, 10 years ago, would I have been able to get around on my own? I mean, a fairly capable guy myself. And I've got a lot of friends who use power wheelchairs. I use a manual chair. I think to myself, 
10 years ago, I would have had a hard time getting around uh, the city, even as accessible as it is. But I think that the real uh, change that you're starting to notice is you nailed it on the head earlier. It's that universal design can actually help business owners increase their bottom line. Right. And as they're realizing that by making their spaces more accessible to just everyone in general and making them wide open spaces, that they're actually getting more and more individuals coming through the door, being able to utilize their products and services. And I think that that's really what has been a springboard for this built environment change, right. uh, as well as obviously individuals like Rick and myself being out there advocating for what the real change is. Let's be real. When you're a business owner, your ultimate goal is to make sure that you can make a profit or make money. Now, I'm not saying that these business owners are driven by money, but of course, a business isn't a business if it's not making money. That's right. So by being able to shift the perspectives and show people that, hey, by a few slight changes, by adding Braille uh, uh, to some of your uh, to some of, say, your signage, uh, by adding alternate menus in restaurants with larger font for people with low vision. Uh, by making some of these changes, which very uh, many of them don't cost a lot of money at all for the business owner, but they make a huge impact on the return for that business. Now you're starting to see a lot of these changes. And we're blessed here in Vancouver, as you guys know, because our SkyTrain system is one of the best in the world as far as infrastructure is concerned. I mean, I can get from the end of Surrey all the way to the west end of Vancouver without uh, much of an incident. Right. And that's great. That's greatly to do with the infrastructure that's been established and the need that has been established. Now, we're not obviously out of the weeds just yet. There's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But if you compare that to some of the things going on in Toronto, which is accessible, but I don't believe as accessible. And then, of course, I've been to New York City. And of course, New York, well, that's an underground subway system. So if I wasn't able to get out of my wheelchair and do a lot of walking, or hold on to railings, I would have probably had a harder time. And you take these things for granted because when I was in New York right. with my wife, um, it's hit or miss. You can't just get off at a station and know that there's an elevator. There's only certain stations that have elevators in New York City. And it isn't always clearly indicated as to where that those stations are. So if you pop off the train and you're in the wrong area of town and you have no idea how now you're going to get upstairs because there is no elevator, well, that's where I really had my eyes open and saying, wow, we do a really good job in Vancouver about making sure people know as best as we can that this is an accessible area and here is the direction to where you need to go. Yeah, it's really true. Uh, I've been the same way. I mean, the, one of the best ways to appreciate your own, your own, the transit system that we have here is to go to a different city and, and see what they have to go through. So, yeah. So, I mean, to your point, uh, 10 years is a long time. We've had a mass increase in the use of technology. I mean, think about phones even 10 years ago. Uh, well, to put it into perspective, things like YouTube and Twitter were barely, I mean, I don't, first of all, YouTube wasn't around 10 years ago. And things like Twitter and social media were just like sort of a, a whisper or an idea at that time. Right. I mean, Facebook was being used, but not to the capacity that it is now. And you nailed it on the head. Today, because of social media, individuals can advocate for what's right for them. And, and I'm going to slip a little tip in there, too, because I noticed that some of the things, uh, you know, we use TransLink here in B.C. And, and sometimes, you know, you can call their support line and say, ask them a question. Oh, is such and such elevator down at this station? But I've actually found the most effective way to find out if there's an outage or a downage when you're on the go is literally just a tweet to TransLink yep. and say, hey, uh, just just wondering, you know, is this elevator down because I'm on my way to a meeting? And I kid you not, within about two to three minutes, I get a response back because they have about five people monitoring that account. And that is honestly the greatest return and fastest return of a response that I've ever seen from TransLink or anybody else. So social media is so powerful. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I commute with the with the train as well. And whenever there's an outage or something or, or you hear rumor that there's an outage, Twitter is the first place you go. Yep. And you can find that information very quickly. Um, technology is becoming more and more accessible. You've got screen reading technology for individuals who are wanting to uh, inquire more and they know their own abilities and they probably have that software pre-installed. Um, there's opportunities for grant programs through partnering organizations to get some of that technology and things installed to make your life easier, to make your employment easier. So, I mean, we really live, honestly, in a golden age. And I know that it, a lot of people think that, you know, their era or their decade was the age to be living in. But I honestly think that as a result of the great opportunities that we've been given here, 
And uh, and what we have at our fingertips uh, in today's age is truly remarkable. I mean, I don't know where I would be without Google Maps. I sure. mean, that yeah. really has made has changed my life because as much as I like to pretend that I was all down with uh, some of the landmarks in Vancouver without Google telling me the most efficient route uh, to take, uh, I don't know where I would be. And, and I swear by that technology. I mean, for us, they say that today people are glued to their technology and their phones like they would be lost if they if they lost their phone. But ultimately, I truly believe that people with disabilities utilize this technology in a totally different way that actually changes their lives and actually creates an opportunity to make their lives better. And, you know, let's forget about the word disability. Let's just talk about accommodation and really working into what that person is able to do. And, and again, that ties back into the focus of the Rick Hansen Foundation, focusing on ability, not disability. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, there was certainly a, a huge jump. I mean, Ryan and I, have, we've we've worked in the AT field for, oh, God, I don't know how long. Just 16, 17 years. Um, so, wow. so, I mean, we've seen, like, there was a huge, the advent of smartphones, I mean, there was a real sort of spike in the, in the potential of what could be done in terms of, of AT. Um, you know, uh, and Apple accessibility, I mean, they've been the leader of the pack for, for you know, over a decade. You know, yeah. and Microsoft now is trying to, to catch up to them. So, you know, I think smartphones was really this huge, huge jump in, in technology that's really opened up the doors uh, for what we're seeing now. Oh, uh, hands down, right? I mean, uh, I use a, I'm an Android guy. I actually like using Android uh, products. That's not a plug at all, but uh, I actually like them better because of uh, the fact that you can install software and technology that's not necessarily, you know, pre-approved yeah. through the through the Apple Store type of thing. And I find that Android, for me personally, has a lot more functionality because it's not as confined. But yes. you said it right there. Apple itself has been doing everything they can to try to incorporate accessibility into their flagship ship products as they're putting them out there. And so I really think that that started to turn heads. And then developers uh, with a little bit more freeform ability through Android technology have been able to say, oh, well, if Apple can do that, we can do that. And we may be able to do certain things even better. So I welcome that competition because anytime right. uh, you, you, know, you can uh, encourage to not have a monopoly on an industry, it creates creates innovation absolutely right? and, and that's what we're witnessing so i love my smartphone uh uh like i say i swear by it and the things you're able to do now with augmented reality right i mean think about how big pokemon go was a few months ago <laughs> that's right right okay not 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 to get people back on pokemon go because i'm sure this is a whole thing but think about it from the aspect of what if you could use a piece of software like that to actually hold it up using your camera to a building and be able to assess how wide a door is before trying to wheel through it for example, is that gonna work for you in your wheelchair? Could you use that to then say, oh, I think the environment here, you know, a lot of architects are talking about, well, then we can pre-design sort of a space and know how it looks using augmented reality right. in advance. But think about the accessibility benefits of something like that. Being able to do uh, measure the length of a hallway or, or to see what a space would look like before knocking down a hammer or taking a hammer to knock down a wall, I mean, there is so much potential here, and you just need the right people plugged in to make that work. Well, there's a lot of work being done on indoor beacons as well, and, and I'm totally blind myself, Marco. Okay. And so I use an Android phone as well with a screen reader on it. But having an indoor beacon, let's say in a mall, as I'm walking through it, I would know that I'm passing London Drugs, I'm passing Michael Hill, I'm passing The Source. You know, and without that, it's just guesswork. Well, actually, that's a great thing, not to turn the interview around on you, but... But tell me a little bit more of that, because now my curiosity is spiked. Uh, I know quite a bit about these beacons, but I'm sure that some of your listeners, maybe they don't necessarily know exactly uh, what that is. And I personally, uh, not to become the interviewer, no. but I think it's really good to expand on that, because as much as we're sitting here talking about physical accessibility, as I said, um, the individuals who are impacted now by the Rick Hansen Foundation also include individuals uh, with uh, visual uh, disabilities, as well as uh, hearing including the mobility so this kind of ties that right in and has the the beacons made a big impact for you and is it only in shopping centers i honestly have never seen an indoor beacon um, or used an indoor beacon yeah. um I, I don't know of any malls locally that are actually implementing them okay but you know so i can't really talk intelligently about usefulness and and 
you know, the different prototypes or protocols that are out there. But Rob, do you know more information on beacons? Well, I think there's, it's something that they're still working on. And I, I think that, uh, I don't think the, the technology is quite there yet from, from what I understand. Cause it's such, yeah. it's so finicky. Um, you mean, cause if you're off by <laughs> 10 meters, yeah. um, you're walking into the gap instead of, you know, electronics boutique so <laughs> and, uh, and you know and you're you went in very to get confused. a video game not buy a polo right yeah. that's right <laughs> yeah. so so I, I don't know my sense is that they're still working on it but i mean i guess the the exciting part about it is that there are so many different um areas that are being developed and with you know, smartphones and app development i mean there are, there are just tons and tons of people who are developing you know er, every week you know on our twitter feed you know, we're going through the news and, and people, you know, posting things. And it's astounding how many things um, from, you know, prosthetic limbs that are being printed by 3D printers now. and Haptic touchscreens. Yeah, yes. haptic touchscreens. Uh, yeah. You know, there's so much going on that it's almost hard to keep up with. And that's oh, the exciting absolutely. part. Oh, no, absolutely. And that's that's the thing that I really think is really cool is that when you have individuals who are passionate about creating technology and they realize, well, wait, if I make a little tweak here and there, I can actually open this up not just to the people that I intended to, but almost by mistake, I've actually made this more accessible, right? right? And that <laughs> happens all the time for individuals. That's a great mistake to have happen. Yeah. Um, so prior to uh, me joining the foundation, my, my background is actually in the video game industry. So I have uh, uh, a diploma in video game design uh, from the Art Institute of Vancouver. Right. And so my whole passion was to be out there creating games and creating software that um, allows people to extend their ability beyond what they thought were possible. And to tie in sort of back what the foundation is doing uh, right now, uh, this year, thanks to the support of the government of Canada, the Rick Hansen Foundation is actually funding a minimum of 50 barrier buster projects across uh, the country to uh, improve accessibility infrastructures and also to raise awareness across Canada. So it's for part of their Access for All Canada 150 signature project because Canada is turning 150 this year. And so you guys inspired me when you said you're talking about those beacons. I'm just thinking what amazing work could be done if somebody were to apply. Now, uh, unfortunately, the applications ended yesterday or the 31st <laughs> rather of March. Right. So uh, they've already uh, determined what 50 projects will be this year. Uh, however, these are the types of things like adaptions to libraries to make them more accessible, making an entire uh, playground in a community more accessible or an inclusive playground with tactile uh, uh, objects in there and being able to roll on in a wheelchair and things like this. Uh, and I think it's fantastic because what the uh, what RHS has been able to do is offer $30,000 for each of these projects. Now, wow, nice. that's a drop in the bucket, but it's $20,000 for the actual infrastructure change. So we're talking about those beacons, $20,000. Yeah, let's let's talk about a project that would maybe ac accommodate beacons, for example, in a physical space. And then $10,000 towards a celebration event. And this is that educational awareness piece we talked about earlier. So $10,000 ties you in to be part of a community celebration or a ribbon cutting where an ambassador like myself would come in, say to a playground that got approved for the $20,000, we'd do a ribbon cutting, we'd make a huge thing of it, um, hundreds or thousands of people maybe hear about it in your community and now know, wait, you're telling me that X playground in my community is now fully accessible? And maybe there's been a parent who's been nervous about bringing their child out with a disability or even disclosing mm -hmm. that their child has a disability and now they feel like they can be involved in their community and that it's way more inclusive. And so that's why I love these Barrier Buster projects because it's bringing people out of the woodworks that wouldn't necessarily come out and say, hey, what can I do in my own community to make an impact? And and so, uh, yeah, I think that that's really what that's all about. So just to, uh, just to add on to that, are, are there any other programs that are going on right now that, that you want to talk about? Uh, as far as through the Rick Hansen Foundation? Yeah, well, that's right. They, they put a lot of time and energy into this Canada 150 Access for All 
uh, project. Um, so I would say the two main projects is that Access for All project and, of course, expanding the Ambassador Program. Uh, because as I don't know if you guys know, but the Ambassador Program was just tailored uh, initially to speak at schools. And although they noticed that that was creating a massive impact for all the things we discussed earlier, um, they said, well, why aren't we doing things where we're having our ambassadors go out to events where Rick himself uh, you know, isn't able to make it to, or, you know, Rick can't duplicate himself at least yet with technology. So <laughs> until such time, he has to trust that uh, us as ambassadors can go and have greater reach across the country right. to go to events like that. And so I think that that's really where the focus should lie is that with the ambassador program and with, uh, uh, what we're doing with Canada 150, we're able to do things like come on podcasts and, and and be ambassadors in that capacity where previously we were just speaking to schools of all ranges. And although that's impactful, as we all know, um, not all Canadians are still in school or still in elementary school. And we want to be able to make as much of a reach as we possibly can. Well, and that's the nice thing about doing the podcast is, you know, originally we kind of thought we we're going to talk about assistive technology and how it impacts people's lives and it kind of evolved into more of human interest stories of people with disabilities but also as well as how the AT fits into their lives and empowers them and we noticed there wasn't a lot of that out there so having the podcast and being able to reach people that we wouldn't normally talk to um, has been really empowering for myself and Mm -hmm. you know we don't get a lot of feedback from our audience but we know we're reaching people and, and that's all that matters. Well, that's, I mean, thank you guys. From the bottom of my heart as somebody with a disability, having a disability my whole life, I'm seeing that change. And, and you know, it's because of individuals like yourself that you're allowing us to give us a soapbox or a platform to really stand up on and be proud for ourselves uh, and who we are. And as I say, not focus on our disabilities, but our abilities. And I think that that's really the takeaway for me is when I go to these and do these presentations, to have people's eyes light up. I, I just did a talk the other day for the Cerebral Palsy Association, and there was actually a mother uh, of somebody with a disability in the audience. And afterwards, I stuck around for a Q&A period, and she put up her hand and said, you know, hey, that was a really f- fantastic and engaging talk that you did, and I want to thank you. And I actually took the opportunity to pause for a second, and I, I, I get the impression she hasn't heard this before, but I said to her, I want to say thank you to you and everyone in the room kind of went quiet. It's like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, you're a mother of a, of a child with a disability. Is that right? Yes, I am. Well, thank you to you because it's, it's mothers like you and it's parents like you who are out there who are looking for opportunities and, and you weren't, held back before we as children couldn't speak for ourselves. And so our parents and our social circles had to be those advocates before we could ever advocate for ourselves. And I saw her eyes start to water up because I really don't think she's ever had that kind of return where somebody with a disability on behalf of her daughter and everyone else in the room said thank you for what it is that they're doing. And so individuals like yourself, guys, who are out there, you know, you're advocating for it. I know that me, I take it very personally. I started my business as a speaker six years ago And it wasn't just about getting out on a stage and speaking my message. It was about representing not just myself, but everyone out there who maybe doesn't have the same abilities that I do. And I take it very serious to advocate because I know some of my friends who are unable to speak or maybe have certain forms of cognitive challenges. They are some of the most intelligent people you'll Mm -hmm. ever meet, but maybe they just communicate in a different way. And so if they tell me they have a certain message that they want to um, get out to the public, I would much rather say that I'm able to help them to deliver that message message and help to change minds now um, and we do it as a collective we do it as a group and we represent not just ourselves but everybody in our community regardless of disability that's right and and you know to add on to that the most important thing to keep in mind is that it benefits everybody it- everybody we always like to say because it it's literally everybody <laughs> and everybody right, <laughs> That's uh, we're, right. we're only <laughs> we're only temporarily able-bodied uh, to certain degrees and so uh you know those one of that's one of those things is like hey i've come into those this world and this is what i've been given to work with so i could literally sit around all day long and have a pity party about where i'm at but if i have 
have that pity party, it's not going to do anything to change who I am as a person. Right. What changes is my attitude. And that's the one thing that I can control. And if there's anything I can give as a takeaway about Rick and the message that he instills is that he himself, like his spinal cord injury happened when he was 15 years old. Right. Imagine when you're in the prime of your life and you've been able to witness, you know, your friends as 12, 13 year olds, 14 year olds, you're playing sports, you think you have your whole life ahead of you. And then it comes to a crashing halt. Well, one of the most impactful things I heard from Rick was when he approached the Great Wall of China uh, on his Man in Motion tour. You now remember, the Great Wall of China wasn't always accessible, <laughs> and even to this day, they have an accessibility route, but it's thanks to this moment with Rick. Uh, he had to be lifted up by a couple of his buddies that were on the tour with him, and there was a point in the time when he was wheeling uh, up the Great Wall where he actually thought he was going to tip backwards, literally, mm. because of how steep it is. But it was in that moment that he got the perseverance and said, yeah, but if I decide that Rick now this is where I stop the tour then that's where people are going to think that that's where it's okay for them to stop too right. and so he kept pushing through and he kept doing it and through all the things they had to experience uh, I, I know that even the, in the BC Sports Hall of Fame there's mention of they were robbed a couple of times during the the, the world tour really? and they, they lost a lot of their equipment but did Rick give up no so as cheesy as that may sound, this is a real story about a real person who cared about making an impact on our country, and he continues to do that today, and that's why I get up in the morning. Wow. <laughs> is I feel I need to live that fire. I need to live that passion for not only myself, but for everyone I interact with. So, well, uh, let, me, let me just ask you, is there anything else you want to talk about, something that we haven't hit on yet? Well, no, um, I think that we pretty much covered everything that uh, you guys were looking for. I, I would say that I, I know you had mentioned, uh, you know, is there do I do I want to talk a little bit about some of my motivational speaking or inspirational speaking? Yep. Um, I, I will say that that for me came out of the opportunity of uh essentially having other barriers when it came to employment because in 2010 I lost my job in the game industry due to the recession right. like many people did and uh, where some people may say you know that was a really really setback moment for them in their lives i actually took it as an opportunity and i will mention that at the time my girlfriend now my now wife uh when i called her to tell her that i'd lost my job i was expecting her to be really upset and i called her and said you know honey unfortunately i found out today that i got laid off and she screamed with joy and i was like <laughs> why are you so excited i just lost my job and she said because your whole life you've been working towards making software and technology to help improve the lives of people with disabilities, but really, I think your your true calling, your true passion is to inspire people. I'm like, oh, okay. She's like, well, you know, you did talking and things like this as an ambassador for many years for a lot of charitable organizations when you were a kid, but really, what about if you were to go out there and do what you really love and maybe start a business about that? And I was like, wow, I never really thought about becoming an entrepreneur. <laughs> and because of her being a really big cheerleader in my corner and because of that moment that some would say was devastating to lose your job, it was the one push I needed to kind of shift focuses and say to myself, well, what can I do to, cre to truly create an impact in my community? And for me, that was to bring an inspir inspirational message. I don't like to call myself a motivational speaker. It's more inspirational speaker because right. everyone is motivated by different things. <laughs> so if I can inspire them to find whatever that motivation means to them, then that's great. And what I did was I created a, a, a way of sort of approaching challenges or approaching goals called the Q principle. And that stands for creatively utilize your best energy. And essentially what it is, it's a way to approach challenges and situations, to look at your own network of individuals and say, what what strengths do I have? Now, what strengths does my uh, network or community have that I could use to, in or, to utilize in order to get past a certain challenge or perhaps to uh, accomplish a goal? And really, it's about teamwork and working together. So what can I do to create situations which are mutually beneficial that will ultimately help me to get to that next goal? And really, that's how I, I uh, attest to the fact that I was able to find guys like Rick. Because if I didn't say yes to that TED talk, I never would have been on that stage. If right. I wasn't on that stage, that individual would never have seen me and reached out to me and said, hey, you were talking about accessible technology. We have this opportunity with the Rick Hansen Foundation. So everything in your life is connected and it's how you choose to approach those situations that will help to define you, not what happens to you in the moment, but what you choose to do about it. Right. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> well, Marco, uh, Thank you so much for joining us today. 
Yeah, thanks so much. I know that I'm a fast talker. I'm an Italian guy. You guys can't <laughs> tell, but I'm talking with my hands a lot yeah. as I'm speaking, too. So hopefully it doesn't flutter in the audio as no, we're speaking. But I get really fired up about this stuff because I care. And if there's any final piece or final message I want to leave people with, it's that you don't have to be some important social media influencer to be making an influence in your community. You can be an average Joe who's out there, who's passionate about who you are and the community that you represent. And it doesn't take tons of money or, or a huge network. It just takes you having the passion to say, today is the day I want to make an, uh, a difference. So everybody has the ability to do what I'm doing here today. Uh, and I just say, own yourself, be authentic, and you will be blown away by the things you can accomplish. Yeah, well, I mean, hey, me and Ryan, I mean, here here we are in his basement doing this podcast. <laughs> I, I mean, we're a testament to that. I mean, you know, we started this podcast in, in a very different manner, and, and we're continuing to plug away at it, and we're continuing to grow. But, I mean, it's the same thing for us. I mean, we're passionate about, about AT. We're passionate about the community. We want to do our part to sort of give what we can to the community. And that's why we're here. Um, so awesome. you're inspiring us. <laughs> awesome. Well, I hope that that existing fire that was in your belly continues to grow and that this is a real eye opener for you guys as far as that the foundation is not just doing one off programs, that they're really doing sustainable programs that is creating a long lasting impact for a lot of individuals. And so I do encourage you ultimately to go over to rickhanson.com, check out about more of the programs and services that they're providing. Right. And hey, if you guys have the time and you're really inspired to do so, even look into becoming an ambassador yourself, represent your story hmm. and learn more about what you can do within your own community to make that impact. Fantastic. Well, we'll make sure that we link, we link to uh, rickhanson.com in our show notes. Uh, now, sure. is there any place where someone can go to, to find uh, out more about you, Marco, or, or yeah, your Yeah, sure, engagements? absolutely. So uh, probably the easiest place for people to go, which will redirect them to my site, is marcopasqua.com. So if you go to my name, M-A-R-C-O-P-A-S-Q-U-A.com, it'll uh, tell you a little bit more about me, my life, and, and what the Cube Principle is all about. Fantastic. All right, Marco, we're, we're going to let you go. Great. Thanks again for joining us. Great. All right. Well, listen, have a good rest of your morning, and we'll talk to you guys soon. You Thanks, Marco. Thanks, so. Okay. Take bye. Care. Bye-bye. Wow. That's yeah, definitely yeah. a motivational speaker. He certainly you know, is. Get your heart going. Get your blood flowing. Yes, and you're pumped. just kind of like, yeah, absolutely. You're just like, I just want to go do something. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I want to go buy the Rogue One Blu-ray. That's right. Take me with you. I want one too. I don't want to wait two days. <laughs> wait, you do want you? I can actually, I can pick you up one a copy, but then I'm not going to see it till next week anyway. So. I'll see you Friday. Oh yeah, see you Friday. Yeah, I can pick you up one if you want. Yeah, sure. Cool. Okay. Yeah. No, he was very well spoken. Very good interview. Yeah, it was, and you know, it was a little bit eye opening. They, they're the. I'm with you. I didn't realize that the um the scope that they had opened up the scope of of mm -hmm. um the Rick Hansen Foundation and the, the disabilities that they advocate for, uh, I, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't realized that, but it makes sense because universal design is universal design, yep. right? Absolutely. Yeah, so. it'll be interesting to look at their website and just kind of see what programs they offer, and, you know, I, I highly recommend people do that and see if there's something, um, you know, that would benefit them. Yeah, I would too, um, for sure. So, hey, Ryan. Rob. Where can people find us? People can find us online at www.atbanter.com. They can also drop us an email if they would like at atbanterpodcast at gmail.com. Woo, first shot. Thank you. Good job. Steve, it's, I'm telling you, it's because it's because Marco inspired me. <laughs> there you go. To be a better podcaster. Excellent. And get the, the effing email right. Excellent. It's awesome. Uh, where else can uh, they uh, they come across us? Find us on the Facebook, yep. on the Twitter. Yep. And I think they can also find us on Instagram. You, they certainly can. In fact, let's take an Instagram picture right now. What would they search for if they want to follow us? Uh, I think it's just AT Banter. Hold on. I'm going to take a live shot of what we're doing right now and I'm going to post it on Instagram right this second. Do, 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 do. This is the type of stuff that you're going to find on our Instagram feed that's going to make you want to subscribe. Hold on, I'm going to find it. There we go. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to use the effing thing too. <laughs> Take a picture. Just a minute. 
take a picture. I don't know. Is it? Either I'm, we're getting stupider as we get older. <laughs> They're making making these apps more complicated. Hold on. <laughs> Isn't it just open the app and take a picture? No. No? No, oh, that'd, yeah, that'd be too easy, I guess. Uh, this, is, this is a crappy picture. Hold on. Let's go here. Crappy picture. Do, do, do. This is why Rob's not a photographer. Yeah. Good job. Okay. Woohoo. Oh, here we go. You know what? This, this this was good in practice, or this was good in theory, but now I'm trying to... i got to learn how to use this there app. There you go. No picture today. I need a teenager to help me yep. with this crap. Watch a YouTube video. Anyways, okay. Uh, where were we? Yeah, so the Instagram and... Uh, I feel like we're forgetting something. No. no, we did the Facebook, the Twitter, the Instagram. Fantastic. The website, the email. We're done. We are. We're done for this week, my friend. Woohoo! So, uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, everybody, for listening in. Don't forget, visit rickhansen.com. And atbanter.com. atbanter.com. And, hey, if you're really feeling adventurous and you want to go check out some AT, you could also go to www.canastech.com, where they have a fine selection of low vision and blindness products for your pleasure. Well, is, is that it? That's it. All right. Thanks, everybody, for listening in. We will see everybody next week. Bye-bye. This podcast has been brought to you by Canadian Assistive Technology, providing low vision and blindness solutions across Canada. Find us online at www.canastech.com. That's C-A-N-A-S-S-T-E-C-H dot com. Or call us toll free at 1-844-795-8324. For all your assistive technology servicing needs, call Chaos Technical Services at 778-847-6840 or find them online at chaostechnicalservices.com. Music provided by bensound.com.